Well, good morning to you, sisters and brothers, and welcome to worship here at Sharon United Methodist Church on this 17th day of January 2021, or what our church calendar tells us is the second Sunday after the Epiphany. Uh, my name is Pastor Mark O'Neill. It's a pleasure to have you join us uh, this morning as we worship our Lord and Savior together. Uh, as far as announcements are concerned, um, remember we're continuing on our daily uh, devotion series based upon the book of James in our New Testament. It's at 10 o'clock each and every day right here on our church Facebook page. That is Monday through Saturday, uh, available for you starting at 10 o'clock. Of course, it will be saved on the church Facebook page. It will also be saved on my YouTube channel. So if you ever miss a session uh, or need to catch up on some sessions or what have you, all the information, all the sessions are saved uh, in those two places. If you ever at any time have any difficulty, any trouble finding anything, uh, do let me know. I'd be more than happy to try to point you in the right direction. Well, friends, as we come together and worship this Sunday morning, I want to offer to you this opening prayer. Let us pray. You speak in unexpected places and with unexpected voices, God. And we aren't always sure how to listen. We aren't always sure who to listen to. We aren't always sure if we're really hearing you. Be blunt with us, please. Be clear. Give us the challenge of loving you, of loving the other, of loving ourselves, and help us to live it out. Because you are God who loves us all, even when we don't know where to turn. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.
come now, friends, to our call to worship. I try to send them out to you each and every week, both by email, if I have your email address, as well as posting them on our Facebook page. Our calls to worship are typically call and responses. So if you are able to find it this week, to download it this week, if you have it handy, then I'm going to ask you to respond after I uh, say my little bit. Uh, if you don't have it, if you weren't able to find it, or if you just simply didn't get it, uh, don't worry. But I encourage you to adopt a posture of prayer as we now enter into our call to worship time together. God whispers to each of us, You are my beloved, created in love for love. My spirit answers, Here I am, Lord. Speak to me anew. God breathes on us the Holy Spirit, knitting many members into one body, the body of Christ. Together we answer, Here we are, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. God has yet more vision for the people. Who will work for God to extend God's kingdom into our hurting world? Here we are, Lord. Empower us for your work. God calls the small and helps them do great things. God calls the weak and reveals their hidden gifts. God calls the rejected and opens their eyes to their worth. Here we are, Lord. Humble and waiting. Then let us gather, old and young, small and great, to dream God's dreams, receive God's power, and do God's deeds. Here we are, Lord. Shine the light of your love on us. Kindle your spirit within us. Work your redeeming will in us, that all the world may be won through the power of your love. Amen. Well, friends, as we come to our first reading of Scripture for this morning, and we await with joyous anticipation what the Lord would have revealed to us through his written word, I want to invite you to join me as we say together our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the Scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John. It is the first chapter. and We'll be looking at verses 43 through 51. So again, this is John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. And it says, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip. And said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. Well, friends, we come now to our time of confession before God and one another and I do implore you, as I try to do each and every week that we enter into this, this space and this time together, that you do take an honest look at the week that just passed, that you reflect upon those things that you said you know you shouldn't, those things you did you know you shouldn't, even those thoughts that you had that you know are not pleasing to God. And so we're going to pray together a prayer of confession. The first part of the prayer, though, is going to be silence. And in the space of that silence, I encourage you to have a conversation with God uh, seeking forgiveness 
of the things that you have done wrong, knowing that, yes, our God is just, but our God is also merciful, willing to forgive us if we just come to him with an honest and contrite heart. So let us now pray a prayer of confession, first in silence. Holy God, we confess that we do not always love our neighbor. We confess that we have despised others, even to the point of hatred. We confess that we have been hurt by others. We confess that forgiveness and reconciliation at times are just impossible for us. We know that nothing is impossible in you. We come to you seeking healing and wholeness for us. Help us, whenever possible, to live in peace with others, to seek reconciliation and healing and forgiveness. For your Son came and lived among us, was betrayed and denied, abused and put to death. He rose again and came with the message of peace to those who had denied him and abandoned him. May we walk in his way. Amen. Friends, for nothing is impossible with God. That's what scripture tells us. There's no place you can go, no end of the earth that you can run where God cannot find you. There's nothing on earth or beyond death that can separate you from the love of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, my friends, you are forgiven. You are loved. You are reconciled to God, invited to live with the love of God forever. Amen. I'd like to invite you now, sisters and brothers, to join me as together we make our statement of faith, we make our confession of faith, we state those things we know to be true, those things as contained in our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our sermon text this morning comes from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. We're in chapter 3, and we'll take a look at verses 1 through 20. So again, this is the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he, Eli, said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you have called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. 
And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hear of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of God, my friends, for you and I, the children of God, thanks be to God. You know, having spent most of my life on the other side of this pulpit, and all those years being years spent in a Methodist church, I am familiar with the comings and goings of our preachers. At our time in our church back in Burlington, we saw four senior pastors come and go. We saw four associate pastors uh, come. Three of them left. The last to start there while we were there is, in fact, still there. And I remember the first time that he preached a service. He got up and asked the congregation to join him in prayer before he started his sermon. We all did. You can hear the, the squeaks and the cracking sounds. We all know them as folks you know, kind of shift their weight a little bit in the pew. They sit up a little bit straighter or they bring their, their, their hands into their lap or underneath their chin getting ready to pray. Everybody bowed their heads. And his prayer was this. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. That was it. And there were a few chuckles here and there when he finished because, I mean, let's be honest, when a preacher invites you into prayer, we have been conditioned, whether it's right or wrong, to expect a little heft to it, haven't we? A little theological meat. Certainly a little more than two sentences containing just six words. I thought a lot about that prayer this week. Not just because of the Old Testament reading for this Sunday, although that is certainly part of it, but it has been on my mind after the events of last week at our Capitol, the events of the past year, and honestly the, the events of the past number of years. Because as I look out at the anger and the tension and the anxiety that has touched all of our lives, in one way or another. I'm left with two questions that I think are perfectly framed by this passage. The first is, are we listening for the voice of God in our lives anymore? And second, are we willing to listen even when we may not like what is being said? See, every time I've heard this passage, every time I've read this passage, every time I have preached it, every time I have heard it preached by others, it's always been a story about Samuel. I mean, after all, this is his call story, is it not? We tell of the perseverance of God, that, that God will keep calling us until we acknowledge it, either positively or negatively, and how once he heard God calling him and he gave himself up to service to the Lord, that Samuel became a trustworthy prophet known far and wide. And similarly, we should all listen for and be attentive to God calling us and the plan God has for our lives. Now, friends, all of that is true. But I'm a little bit afraid that as a culture, we've become a little more like Eli than we are like Samuel. And here's what I mean. 
Verse 1 that we read just a bit ago tells us that the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. And I found myself this week asking the question, why? Why would the Lord choose not to speak to his chosen people? Why would he seem to cease all communication with his beloved sons and daughters, particularly one of his priests? Well, maybe, maybe God didn't stop speaking. Maybe they stopped listening. Eli, in particular. If you go back to chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, we meet a woman who was to become Samuel's mother, whose name was Hannah. Now, Hannah was a co-wife with another lady. The man had two wives. But she was her husband's favorite. Unfortunately, she was also barren. She couldn't have children. And the other wife, who could have children and also knew that she was the husband's favorite, picked on her about it over and over again, chastised her about it. And picked on her so much that Hannah became downcast and sad. She badly wanted a child, desperately wanted a child. It's so like many of us, she decided to pray about it. In fact, she goes to the temple where Eli is the priest and she prays about it. She prays aloud and with great weeping says that if she is so blessed by God to have a child, that she will give that child in service to the Lord. If only, Lord, you will grant me a child, she says. Once he is of the proper age, I will bring him to the temple and he will live a life in service to you. And as she is praying this prayer, Eli is watching her. And soon Hannah's prayers become silent prayers, but she continues to move her lips. There's no sound coming out of her mouth, but she is in deep, deep, concerted prayer, moving her lips, tears streaming down her face. And so Eli, the priest, does what any priest would do. He comes to her and he prays with her and he comforts her, right? No. He doesn't do any of that. Instead, he tells her, Woman, how long are you going to stay here? You're making a drunken spectacle of yourself. Why don't you get out of my temple and go back to whatever party that you came from? heart and a mind full of judgment towards Hannah because she wasn't praying in the proper form and maybe she wasn't praying using the right words or maybe she looked a little off. Eli judged her by her outside appearance, not seeing what was in her heart. Have you ever thought or felt that way about someone? She explains to him that she's not drunk. She is, in fact, in fervent and honest prayer. He kind of half apologizes, and she goes away. And then a few months later, a blessing. Her son Samuel is born to her. And as she promised, after a few years, Hannah brings him to the temple, and he, she gives him to Eli. And there's this beautiful prayer by Hannah in chapter 2 of this particular book, but we, we kind of forget it because right after that prayer, we are introduced to Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And these two guys, well, let's just say they were the worst. Scripture says that they were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. They were stealing sacrifices. They were sleeping with women just outside the sanctuary, engaging in all sorts of shocking behavior. And Eli knows all about it. He confronts them, but they don't listen, and Eli seems to be, well, boys will be boys. Even when another prophet tells him that the Lord sees what is going on, and is going to put an end to Eli's line, meaning that his sons and Eli are all going to die, Eli doesn't seem really that concerned. And he continues to tolerate and turn a blind eye to what is going on in his presence. After all, these were his people, so how bad could it really be? I mean, after all, at least they aren't like those Philistines. You ever felt that way? Rationalized behavior you knew wasn't right? but implicitly condone it because they were your people or they were on your side. And then we get to chapter 3, part of which we read this morning. 
And we excuse Samuel for not recognizing God's voice initially in the story because, after all, he is still just a young boy. And Scripture says that he did not yet know the Lord. So we kind of forgive Samuel. But who else in our story didn't recognize that God was speaking? It's Eli. The line in verse 2 says that his eyesight had become dim so that he could not see. And we assume that it's talking about his physical sight and his actual eyeballs. But I wonder if that's also an allusion to his spiritual sight. Judging his sister in Christ. Turning a blind eye to the sin taking place in his own household. One of my commentaries says that when the prophet gives this message in chapter 2 announcing the end of Eli's line, that the prophet reminds Eli of the privilege his ancestor received through the priesthood and indicts Eli for his neglect, disrespect, and greed and announces the end of his priestly line. You think maybe this is why Eli didn't hear God speaking in the temple to Samuel? Or that is why the first two times Samuel came for him, he didn't discern that it was God speaking to Samuel? I don't think the word of the Lord was rare because God wasn't speaking. It seems rare because Eli has allowed such a chasm to exist between him and his Lord through his neglect, his disrespect, and his greed that he simply couldn't hear it. Now, I don't know much about Eli before what is recorded here. He first comes into Scripture in chapter 1 of this book. By chapter 4, he's dead at age 98, having served as judge of Israel for 40 years. But the impression you get from him is that by the end of his life, he become a corrupt, apathetic, lazy man, content to sit idly by with little time spent in prayer, little time spent in the Hebrew Scriptures, little time teaching or learning or any of that. He seems content to be so apart from God. And I worry this morning, friends, that as we gather, that we have allowed a similar chasm to exist between us and God, making it hard for God, well, making it hard for us to hear God speaking to us. And instead of a passive chasm, though, like Eli, we seem determined to fill this chasm with what our little green friend from last month would refer to as noise, 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 noise. And I further worry that we're okay with that. That we have allowed some form of neglect and disrespect and greed to pervade our lives as well. We live in a time where we have more information readily available to us at the snap of a finger than at any time in human history. But fortunately, we also have less knowledge. And even more alarmingly, even less wisdom. We have lost the art of critical thinking. We have lost the art of conversation because the internet means and texting means we don't have to interact face to face anymore. And so when we go online or we watch television, everything now is breaking news. Everything is a catastrophe. Everything is something that should make you angry as an American. Everything is something that you absolutely positively must have an opinion about right now. And so we go further into the internet or, or further into social media and we search out those articles or those posts that agree with our side. And then we use those posts and articles as evidence to strike blow after blow against the ignorant horde that dare have a different opinion than we do. And then we judge and then we disrespect others. Oh, those godless Democrats. All oh, those hateful racist Republicans. And then we neglect the sin. Whatever it is happening in our own backyard, among our people, averting our eyes from it because, well, at least they're on the right side. And we say that we want God's will to be done, but friends, truthfully, from what I've seen lately, what, are we, what we are really saying is that we greedily want God to do our will. And that chasm gets wider and wider, and our eyesight gets dimmer and dimmer. And it feels as if the word of the Lord is rare. And I don't know about you, friends, but all this hatred and anger is making me tired. Because we have stopped listening for God. 
preferring instead to listen to, and in many cases, seeking out the noise, 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 noise. I spoke to my clergy mentor this week. And he told me, you know, as you let your spiritual practices go, and that time with God becomes smaller and smaller, or less and less, what you find is that into that vacuum or into that space comes things we normally wouldn't want. And he's right. And I think that what is occupying that space now for many of us is anger. As a culture, we have become so used to being angry that now, as odd as it may sound, we look for it. We need it. We thrive on it. So I'm going to go read stuff that I know is going to make me hot. I'm going to lurk over that person's Facebook account or their Twitter feed or their blog that I know I don't agree with just so I can see what they're writing, just so I can get mad about it. And then I'm going to argue about it with them. Got a news flash for you, sisters and brothers. Not a single person, not one, has ever changed their mind over a witty Facebook post or comment. None. It is a fruitless exercise that we engage in daily, some a number of times each day, that only serves to drive us further from God and further from each other. But we do it. Because it's a whole lot easier to be a keyboard cowboy than talking with somebody face to face. And so friends, I have to ask this morning, are you listening for God's word? Are you listening for God to speak into your life? You can't do it with one eye on the laptop and the other eye peeping at your phone. You can't do it with your preferred news channel on in the background. You can't do it with your mind filled with all the issues and concerns and worries and doubts and baggage that we tend to try to cling to. Not because God can't cut through all that stuff, because he certainly can. It's because we can't. We are flawed, failed, weak people, and unless we intentionally seek the Lord, we will be distracted by all things great and small. So I challenge you this week, find a place away from the noise, away from all distractions, and simply say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Breathe in and breathe out. Be calm. Feel the peace that washes over you, a peace that is beyond all understanding. Listen for his voice. Friends, I promise you, it's going to be okay. And you say, well, Pastor Mark, I've done that, and he is not speaking to me. Well, might I suggest that he speaks to us each and every day through this Bible. If you believe, like I do, that the words contained in this book are the very words of our Creator, put down into writing through authors filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, then, friends, every page is God speaking to you. When I say, after every reading we do in worship, that this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God, I don't say it just because it presents for me a simple transition from one point of the service to the next. I say it because I believe it. I believe it. And if you are ever confused as to if what you are hearing or reading or seeing is of God or not, compare it to Scripture. If it doesn't match God's word as recorded in Scripture, then it is not of God. You don't want it, you don't need it, you need to put it back. Now understand, my friends, that listening means sometimes having to hear something we would rather not hear. In the chapters before our reading this morning, Eli had been warned that God was unhappy with him and his son. He was told that God was going to end his line. He knew that he had transgressed and was going to be punished. When the Lord God himself tells this to Samuel and Eli asks what the Lord told him, Eli says, Samuel, listen, don't hold back. Tell me what he told you. And Samuel tells him. And again, Eli has to hear difficult words. Friends, sometimes God has difficult words for us as well. Exposing our hidden secrets, bringing our sins into light, challenging our prejudices and our assumptions, pointing out our anger, 
causing us to take a good, hard look at ourselves, how we behave, the words that we use, the opinions that we hold. Sometimes it means that we have to do one of the hardest things in this world. Admit that we were wrong about something. But this is not done out of hate or anger or because God enjoys making us suffer. He does this because he loves us. Because he desires nothing more than to be in a relationship with us and for us to be in a relationship with our brothers and sisters. We can't have a relationship with God or with each other so long as our hands are balled up in a fist looking for a fight. Only with an open, outstretched hand, stretched out in prayer to the Lord, and stretched out to our brothers and sisters in love, can we start the kind of reconciliation that our word de world desperately needs? Let those with ears hear, my friend. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to invite you now to join me in prayer together. Let us pray. Eternal God, you are the maker of us all, and we are your creation. People formed in your image as individuals, as communities, formed and fed and furnished with understanding of who you are and of who and whose we are. We worship you today in recognition of your calling, of your communicating, of your caring to invite us to share in your creative and healing work. We are here because we have heard you speak in us and through others. Help us, dear Lord, to ever respond to you and your invitation to your grace. God, of all our moments, of our days and our nights, you speak and you act in the world around us. Not only to call all people to you, but also to direct and guide us in the way of healing and wholeness. Awaken us, Lord, to hear what you would say to us. Help us to open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to your presence. Help us to know when it is your voice we are hearing and when it is our prejudices and desires to which we are paying heed. Lord, we pray that your church may rise up with renewed commitment in answer to your call, that your people may be instruments of your grace and love. We pray for those who consider themselves inadequate and dismiss or avoid your calling in their lives. Give them a new vision, a vision in which you are their strength and their hope. We pray for those who, in answering your call, must leave the known for the unknown, the oasis for the desert, the comfortable for the uncertain. Grant them courage and steadfast faith. We pray, too, today, O Lord, for those in want and need, for those of us and of the larger community who suffer in body or in soul, we remember before you now those we name to you either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts. Loving Father, bless us all with an abundant faith, a fruitful ministry, a joyful life. Bless us and all those who gather together to continue the work of Jesus who came to heal, save, and deliver us all, and who taught us to pray as one family, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Well, friends, now will be the time we would normally pass our offering plates through our sanctuary. Of course, we're not doing that in this time of church life together, this season of church life together. But I do want to say a prayer over our offerings to, uh, to just say how much I appreciate the continued and faithful giving that you have have done and also want to say a prayer in anticipation of future giving 
and encourage all of you to continue to give toward the mission and ministries of this church. Hear now this prayer over our offering. Holy God, like the first disciples, we have heard the call to follow Jesus. Yet too often we have failed to introduce him to others, not willing to take the risks that go with true discipleship. As we bring our tithes and offerings to you this day, make us bold in following. May we give more readily, love more deeply, show mercy and compassion more extravagantly, and seek justice for others courageously. Help us to walk in the steps of the one we follow. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. for deceit, but offer yourselves as a temple for the Holy Spirit. And may God be with you and speak through you. May Christ Jesus be one with you and raise you to life. And may the Holy Spirit dwell within you and make you holy. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Everlasting 
Peace with my Lord so near 